Hello, my name is Guy Wallace, and this is my video series entitled Adventures in Performance-Based Training and Development with your host, Guy Wallace, me. This is also known as the Insomnia Solution. Not my insomnia, yours. Just kidding. This is the fifth yeah. video in the series, and what I'd like to focus on in this uh, video is my relationship, my history with the International Society for Performance Improvement, ISPI. I joined the organization in September of 1979, a month after I just joined a training organization after getting out of college, and I was in Saginaw, Michigan, <clears throat> but the local chapter was in Detroit, so it was a 90 mile uh, each way uh, journey that we made uh, 10 months, nine months out of the year, I forget. Um, and so I was going to the first chapter meeting after the summer break. Uh, there were a lot of uh, people in the education system were part of this and they had the summer off and so the society, the chapter there. But the, the chapter was named MSIT, the Michigan Society for Instructional Technology. Uh, it was a chapter of NSPI at the time, which was the, then the National Society for Performance and Instruction. It had previously been known as the National Society for Programmed Instruction back when it started back in 1962. But they had uh, changed the name when the, uh, many of the founders and members recognized, realized that they could deliver perfect training, perfect instruction, and it often didn't change anything in the performance context. And so they started looking at the other variables and realized that really there were many other things you had to look at before you started focusing on people's knowledge and skills. You know, for new hires, yeah, that's what they need. But for incumbent populations, that perhaps is not the root cause of any of the performance issues that their management or and the performers themselves may recognize. So training is not going to solve that. Um, but anyway, so when I joined MSIT in Detroit, um, it, it was a very heady experience for me. I began to meet a whole bunch of people that later on I would realize were kind of a big deal. They were somewhat renowned in the field in this particular professional society. Now there was also the American Society for Training and Development that had previously been known as the American Society for Training Directors, and that original organization was co-founded by my second wife's grandfather, who was one of the, I think it was five or six people that started uh, ASTD, and he was running a trade school in Florida, and what they wanted to do was create basically a community of practice, if you will, for directors of training organizations, uh, technical schools in the education system, in corporate America, it was a U.S. centric kind of an organization uh, then and has since broadened out and ASDD has changed their name to ATD, Association for Talent Development. But So they're, they're focused on the training thing as well. The big difference between the two organizations I think is, be, is the uh, uh, ISPI, NSPI is more focused, focused on performance in all of the variables and later on ASDD started to look at uh, things beyond knowledge and skill uh, contributions or, or the lack of knowledge and skills and, and the effect in the uh, workplace. So I joined this organization. I met their first meeting. We went to a place where there's a restaurant so we could have the, uh, as they joked, the rubber chicken dinner and we would see great presentations. So you'd forgive the rubber chicken dinner because you were going to see great stuff. And I'd heard about this for a month now about how cool this was going to be and all that stuff. So we go and I'm talking with somebody and, and I met this guy, uh, Brian Desitels. And Brian is standing there telling me about what happened in the very last meeting before they took the summer break. And it seems there was a presenter and he was presenting something that some in the audience knew better, knew that that was not valid, incorrect. And so there was a guy named Frank Widra, <clears throat> happened to be the not the founder of this MSIT group, which was actually started by a bunch of nuns in the Detroit area, and I can't remember the whole story about that. But Frank Widra, who was uh, in charge of training, I guess, at Allied uh, Supermarkets, um, was looking for some venue 
in order to train his management staff and his individual practitioners in the training organization that he was in charge of. Um, and so he saw this as an ideal opportunity to take that group and leverage it, kind of take it over um, and bring in great speakers so that he could provide professional development to his staff and to others in the Detroit community. And uh, but anyway, so he took exception to what the presenter was presenting and he went and found himself a pair of scissors and they happened to be the little rounded, you know, kid scissors, round, blunt ed ended scissors. And he cut the cord on the overhead projector. Now, for those of you who are younger, uh, the overhead projector is where we took uh, overhead transparencies, sometimes called foils, and laid them on top of the projector and the light would shine up to uh, mirrors and it would shine it onto a screen or a wall or whatever you got. Anyway, so very old tech. But anyway, so he cut the cord on this projector and and got a shock and, you know, went and uh, according to the stories and uh, he said, OK, this is bullshit. Let's all reconvene in the bar because it was a restaurant. There was a bar. And so everybody got up and went to the bar early. Normally they do this after the session, but he cut that speaker off cold. And I thought. How cool is that? I'm with this organization who's not going to let me be misinformed about what's what, what works, what the research says. Um, and uh, so decades later, I'm relating this very story to somebody and Danny Langdon, who's one of the uh, gurus in the society and the movement, uh, overheard me and he came up and he said, Guy, I was speaking at the first chapter meeting that you went to and I heard Brian telling you that story. And I became a little bit worried for myself as to what Frank might do to me. And he knew Frank and Frank was a character, the late Frank Wydra, um, who was a proponent of uh, individual control learning and um, learner controlled learning, excuse me. and. Uh, um, wrote chapters on that and he had he had a big influence on me too. Frank was a really nice guy, left the society for a while, came back after a few years and he and I would always meet in the bar and and we'd each have a Sambuca on the rocks, me, me I don't know, I can't remember what he did. But uh, he was a great guy and uh, I miss him uh, greatly as many people in the Detroit community uh, also miss Frank. But uh, so that was that was an interesting story. That was my entree into the organization. And I was actually very excited to know that because I have a radio TV film degree and I entered a training organization. I don't know anything about training. I know about how to produce video and that's what I was there to help do. But I ended up like in the military, you know, if you're a barber, they're going to make you a cook. If you're a cook, they're going to make you a barber. I came in with my video degree, didn't get placed in the video side of the training organization that I had just joined. And I got put into the program development side. So my first job title was program developer, training developer basically. And so I would uh, go along and conduct analysis and co-conduct analysis and I was learning how to do analysis and then we would do design which was a pretty set thing. We were producing video based training, 15 minutes of video, no more, no less, because there's always more than 15 minutes and you had to kind of skinny it down to fit into the 15 minute on basically product knowledge for Wix Lumber, uh, lumber centers and there were these were either 183 of those or 283 I can't remember the right number but that was our audience and I had come from one of those stores uh, in Lawrence Kansas where I was going to the University of Kansas and getting my degree in radio TV and film and I had been recommended to be hired into this and anyway so I so I joined this organization but I was a little bit fearful that I did not know what I was doing and I felt confident in the people that I was working with, but I still wanted to know myself. So I was very happy to hear that I had just joined at the chapter level this organization that wasn't going to be pushing snake oil at me or foo-foo or bullshit or whatever you want to call it. But uh, so the story that Brian Desitels told me uh, made me very happy and glad that I had joined. Now, besides Brian, I also met Kathleen Whiteside uh, Erica Keeps, Harry Leibowitz, uh, of course Frank Widra, and many others as part of that chapter. Um, those, those people in particular had a larger role to play in the international or the national level of NSPI at that time. And so 
That was September of 79. In April of 1980, I went off to my first conference, the National Conference in Dallas, Texas, and I got to meet, oh, so many great people. Uh, they wouldn't have remembered me. You know, I was being introduced to them by others that knew them, but, you know, I was the new guy. And uh, so I met uh, Gary Rumler, who became one of my uh, key mentors later on. I got to know him and work with him later on in my next job. But uh, also, I, and I met Tom Gilbert, but he would have never remembered me. Uh, it was just a quick fleeting thing. I met Joe Harless, met Bob Mager, and many, many other people, you know, too numerous to names. Uh, it's unfortunate that uh, they don't all get the credit for their major contributions uh, to the technology, the application of science, of uh, basically what's now called learning sciences. So what, what's, what was called research-based back then is now later on be calling either evidence-based or evidence-informed, uh, but it's really all about you know what works and under what conditions does it work and do we have those conditions and let's you know go after and and improve performance, which was the, the whole nature of the thing. Um, so, I became a national member at uh, NSPI in a in April, but I got to go back to so on the ride home from my very first chapter meeting, I'm talking to two of my peers that had just recently come from Detroit, had worked with Gary Rumler's brother at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Detroit. And, and so on our way back, I was informed, because this is how it worked back in the, in the days, boys and girls, I was informed that I'd been signed up to be on the newsletter committee. And I was gonna contribute to the local chapter through writing articles and doing write-ups of presentations and coming speakers and things like that. And, you know, back in the old days, that's how it happened. Your boss signed you up for things and that was now part of your job, you know, uh, ancillary duties as assigned. And so, but I was kind of excited about that. I, I liked writing. And uh, so I contributed and started giving back to that, my professional society, uh, really starting after that first meeting. Um, uh, a couple of years later, uh, my wife got transferred uh, to Chicago with Wix, another part of Wix Corporation. And so I went uh, looking for a job and I got a job at Motorola and I left my home chapter, MSIT, and I joined the Chicago chapter of NSPI in 1981. There I met Judy Hale and Mark Rosenberg, uh, Odin Westgard, uh, um, Jim Campbell, um, and again, uh, you know, more people than I really should have attempted to, to begin the list, but I met some people who were uh, movers and shakers in the uh, performance orientation to instruction or training or learning or whatever you, what label you want to put on all of that stuff, but looked beyond knowledge and skill deficits in the workplace and try to identify what those are and flag those. And even if it's not in their you know, uh, wheelhouse to go and address the root causes, they could at least flag that for their clients. And if and when training became appropriate as part of the solution set or as the single solution, then they would do a good job of that and have a performance orientation, which meant you were cognizant of the outputs and the tasks to be performed to produce those outputs and the measures for both. That's my shorthand description of, you know, what performance-based training and development is all about. As a Chicago chapter member, I, uh, uh, I joined the conference committee for the 1983 conference, which was going to be in Detroit, and the year after that, 84, was going to be Chicago. So my intention was to be on both conference committees. They usually ran two years prior to the conference as you geared up and it was just an all volunteer effort. There were no paid staff that you know went around and did all these things. It was all members that did it. And so I got a chance on that conference committee to work with uh, Odin Westgard and Rob Fauché and Mark Rosenberg. Um, the four of us were involved in, they were more interested in working for the Chicago uh, 1984 conference and I was interested in really going and affecting the 1983 conference that was going to be in Detroit so I met a lot of people got to work with them closely you know this is back in the day when you did face-to-face -face meeting and conference calls and individual calls and uh, letters through the US mail and you know that's how we communicated it's uh, actually much easier now and which uh, creates more of a burden usually because it's so darn easy to communicate with everybody and over communicate and 
uh, potentially waste everybody's time. But uh, so once I I've been in uh, Chicago for 18 months and I was working for Motorola's uh, what became Motorola University, but they were Motorola's training and education center, um, and I got a chance to work with um, uh, Gary Rumler. He worked on a bunch of my projects. He was my consultant, which meant that you know I carried his pencils around as we went from interview to interview, observation to observation, uh, building to building, site to site, you know, all over the Motorola system because my uh, my clients were the manufacturing, materials, and purchasing organizations across five business sectors, as Motorola called their strategic business units. And uh, Gary and I were were go working on projects for them. Um, but after 18 months, I left and I joined a small consulting firm that was owned by Ray Svensson and uh, Bill Wiggenhorn, the head of Motorola's Training and Education Center, had put my wife together with Ray and my wife was working with Ray and it was the two consultants and a secretary, if you will, that's what we called it back in the day. And uh, they decided they were going to expand because they were getting very busy and I said, oh, I think I want to join you. And so I did, and they hired another administrative assistant secretary to work along. So there were three consultants and two of them, and eventually we grew the staff to between 20 and 25, it varied, uh, over the next 15 years. But uh, so my first day on the job with Ray, November 1st, 1982, he and I flew to Houston, and we were going to work with our client Exxon. But... The evening that we arrived, uh, we went from the airport straight to an NSPI chapter meeting in Houston. So Houston had a chapter back in those days. And J Ray and I spoke on uh, the group process for job models. So one of the things that we did differently than most people in the training business is that we, instead of doing traditional interviews and observations and document reviews in order to pull together the content that was necessary. We facilitated a group of master performers, other subject matter experts, sometimes supervisors and managers, and sometimes uh, novice performers, depending on the context and et cetera, what the clients felt comfortable with. And we would do in two or three day analysis meeting what might take three, four weeks or months to do analysis, and we would both identify what the performance requirements were of the job, do a gap analysis against those performance requirements, systematically derive the enabling knowledge and skills. But we were there at the Houston chapter to talk about doing job models, which later on I changed that language to performance models because a lot of the performance that I was looking at was beyond a single job. It was often a process involving many different job titles, and so it seemed funny to call the document that captured that performance at a fairly granular level a job model. Jobs model may have been more appropriate, but anyway, so I changed the performance model and uh, so I have contributed to the proliferation of overlapping and conflicting language that uh, the profession suffers from, but uh, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. So I continue to attend these uh, national and then later on when when national NSBI became international ISBI I continued to attend the conferences and between 1980 and 2012 I attended 31 of 33 conferences it was my professional home in uh, 1985 I started in 84 I was presenting at the chapter level and I took that presentation that I did at the Chicago chapter in the fall of 83, 84, excuse me, I presented that same uh, presentation at the National Society a Conference in 1985. And that's how we used to do it in the old days. You'd go to the chapter, make a presentation, get your feedback, get reviews, and you'd take that review data and you'd be part of your submission to National and they would either accept or reject your presentation based on, you know, have you done this before? Who could attest to, you know, the quality of what you're talking about? The uh, the, uh, you know, does it does it fit what the science of training or learning was all about back in those days? And so either it did or it didn't. It either met the the requirements or it didn't. But the, so I was lucky that I was uh, accepted to propose at the uh, international level in 1985 on performance-based curriculum architecture design via a group process. So that's been kind of my thing. Um, 
Uh, so I presented that in 85, but the year before in 84, Ray Svensson, my wife Karen, and I and an associate on one article, we wrote an article that got published in Training Magazine September of 84 on uh, basically curriculum architecture design via a group process. Um, the editors of Training Magazine and all their wisdom changed the title and subtitle, but then in the description of what the article was about, they kind of, they captured it. But uh, editors do those kinds of things. Never fault a author for the title and subtitles and even the, even all the content because the editors can get in there and do whatever they want with it, which is uh, sometimes fortunate and uh, sometimes unfortunate. But we'd also written an article that got published in NSPI's journal um, two months after the Training Magazine article came out, and it was about how to conduct analysis using a group process approach. Again, master performers, which are basically subject matter experts, except they're more than just subject matter experts. They actually can perform the job to a level of mastery. And those are the people that you really want. Uh, we use the label uh, SME, subject matter experts, which also means nowadays uh, small to medium-sized enterprises, which causes confusion in the marketplace. Um, but uh, so you can't rely on SMEs and even one at a time. What the research tells us is that an individual SME can miss up to 70% of what a novice needs to know in order to be able to perform. So they'll miss, you know, some of the steps, some of the nuances in the steps because they're operating on what Richard E. Clark, Dick Clark, taught me was non-conscious knowledge. You know, unconscious knowledge back in your long-term memory. You're using it, but you don't even know. You're not even aware of it. You've forgotten. You know, it's the old saw of, you know, uh, he's forgotten more than he uh, uh, knows. And uh, and I think that's very true. If we uh, can miss up to 70%, we're able to perform, but we can't articulate what it is and how we do it and we'll miss 70 percent so there's got to be a mechanism in place to deal with that and uh, Dick Clark uses something that's called cognitive task analysis but uh, 15 years ago he warned me that they'd done a study at the University of Southern California where he was a professor and and they had come up with a list of over 100 different cognitive task analysis methodologies and he said many of them were not valid many of them didn't really get after the, the, cog, the tasks that are, you know, uh, cognitively that uh, somebody can perform, but they, you know, they can't recall it readily, easily. And so there's a method for doing that. He's got his, and, but I've been using this group process, which is somewhat equivalent because you put together eight to 12 master performers and you ask them questions and you put it on the flip chart and whoever said something, I put it on the flip chart and then other people would critique it and, and fix it because it would always be missing something. It'd be the equivalent of somebody telling me, okay, step one is this, step two is that, step three is that, four and five, and give it to me. I'd write it all down. And somebody in the audience, in the analysis team, for example, would say, uh, you know, Bob, you uh, you missed something there between three and four. You, you know what I'm saying? And, you know, Bob would go, no. And they'd say, well, aren't you missing this step and this sub step and that step and this other sub step? And Bob would go, oh, yeah, you're right. I, I forgot about it. And it would kind of embarrass them, but but so master performers will amend each other's articulation of performance, of gaps, of the knowledge and skills required, um, because that's just how we are all wired to work. We can't remember and keep in our working memory and our conscious memory every last detail. We drive a car mostly on non-conscious knowledge. If you've ever arrived at home and pulled up to the garage and looked and said, wait a minute, how did I get here so quickly? I hope I stopped at all those stop signs and I hope I didn't run any red lights because I don't remember. Well, that's because you're operating the vehicle on non-conscious knowledge, which is a scary thought, especially if you've got you know teenagers driving for the first time <laughs> and you're not even sure what they're conscious of or unconsciously uh, capable of doing. Anyway, so, that's what that was all about. But so we presented to the local chapter. Uh, we, uh, somebody, people would always come up at the end and talk to you about all of this stuff. And uh, we talked to someone there who actually became a client of ours at three different organizations. The organization they were currently at, and then they moved. We did work for them there, but we did basically 
this performance orientation, this job modeling, performance modeling, as the anchor to the instruction we put together. And for his, that first project that we got from me presenting there, Ray and I worked on this, and uh, I think a couple other people on our staff may have worked on it too. It's been a long time. But uh, we basically created a, what, what, the, what the client's view was that he wanted a book that people, a pamphlet that they could pull out of their back pocket. This was for people working on an on a oil and gas pipeline um, uh, for Tenneco. Um, and it was a, a subsidiary of Tenneco, and I can't remember the name of the group. But basically, so these are people who are working on the pipeline in Texas and all throughout the, the southern part of the United States and moving natural gas primarily uh, from the fields where they had are capturing that then they send it down through the pipeline to you know to the city of your choice and that's where people get their natural gas from but anyway so we got all these pipeline workers they have a lot of tasks to do they got to maintain valves they got to inspect the pipe looking for corrosion they got to clear trees and bushes and you know weeds from the pipeline grounds and they have to do all that kind of stuff and uh, so he wanted to provide them with a pamphlet that would have every single aspect of their job captured in that pamphlet, that booklet. Basically, a series of job aids that said, no kidding, this is what you gotta do. And if it's tricky stuff, here's reminders and pictures and all of that kind of good stuff. And that's what the deliverable was. And we work with him on the um, architecture of that content, something that we called curriculum architecture. It was in that first um, uh, presentation that I did for NSPI, um, but uh, it was something that I, when I was working at Motorola, Bill Wiggenhorn brought Ray Svensson in to speak to the newly assembled 13 training project supervisors in a brand new corporate training group. Um, they'd done away with corporate training for 10 years and they were reinstituting it because they saw major challenges coming down the pike for them in the electronics world, communications uh, technology world, uh, primarily from Asia, from Japan. And uh, so we were gonna need to you know, tune everybody up. And so uh, Bill brought Ray Svensson in and he came in and talked to us about this concept of a thing called curriculum architecture. It came out of the Bell System Center for Technical Education it came from the IT world. Now, IT used to mean in, instructional technology, but it was become it, it became information technology as the MIS Management Information Systems took on a new name. But the people in the IT world at the Bell System Center for Technical Education in Lyle, Illinois, at the time, um, were saying, "Hey, why don't we have an architecture of content? It's like you know a whole program of lines of code." And if you could take some of that code out and put it over here and create a derivative product, because some people need that and they don't need everything over here. Some people need the whole thing, this whole program of lines of code, but you could extract things and create derivatives. And so that was the, and we could modularize code knowing darn well that this cut and paste function, I'm making this up because this isn't from the world. You know, we're gonna use that cut and paste function like in all of our software in the spreadsheet stuff, in the word processing stuff, in the PowerPoint presentations, etc. So that was an example of sharing content across multiple products. And so he came and presented on that, and I really thought it was a great idea. So I did one for my manufacturing clients and for the manufacturing supervisors. They wanted something called the ABCs of, in, of supervision at Motorola Manufacturing, and but they couldn't agree on you know really what that was. So I'd done one. And so Ray heard about it and then took a look at it and then decided, you know, uh, my wife Karen and he had done this analysis for Exxon USA in Houston. Um, they uh, had this analysis data from running the group meetings to gather the data with a team of, I think they had a fairly large group here because the client had been struggling for nine months on trying to get a handle on, you know, what do geologists and geophysicists need when they're searching for oil, the exploration group, when they're searching for oil in the sands of West Texas and the Rocky Mountains and the tundra of Alaska and offshore, because they all said, well, that's all very different. And it wasn't, it wasn't different. There were underlying knowledge and skills that people had to have, regardless of where you were gonna make the play and drill for oil. 
uh, and as they explored for oil to try to prove in, prove out, you know, oil fields. And uh, but anyway, so um, I was asked to do that project with Exxon. Uh, over two weekends while I was still an employee at Motorola and I did that and it was well received and so I left Motorola joined Ray and I was going down to Houston to work with Exxon to build a couple of modules and then we'd back out a template and their issue was the field was getting uh, tired of waiting for corporate tr headquarters training folks to produce content so they started taking all the analysis data and design data that we'd given them and they started creating content and of course using different formats and all sort you know bad stuff just all this variation you know and so the client decided oh we better do something about it let's build some templates and then we can give the field people these templates and they can create the content they can kind of test it see if it works fix it you know to make it right because of this non-conscious knowledge thing here you, those experts creating that content were always missing things and they would discover it when they went to go use it and so that's why I was going to Houston, but we had this presentation at NSPI, my first pre presentation. So, but this whole curriculum architecture thing became kind of my thing. And again, as I said, in, in 84, I presented at the Chicago chapter on, on that approach, that level of ISD, a higher level, an engineering architectural level to ISD. So if, uh, uh, so if instructional design, the ADDI level, if that's building, product, a product or some products, this curriculum architecture was to figure out the whole continuum of learning or training that was necessary to grow people from how, whatever knowledge and skills they had coming in the job, into the job, to becoming proficient, to becoming masters, if you will. And of course, on the front end, the people that you're hiring into these jobs, they have education, they may have experience, so there was a varied set of incoming knowledge and skills. And so the way we addressed that was to have a highly modular curriculum so that the learners, the performers, could skip what they didn't need, take what they did need, and, we develop, and I developed the training and development path, and that's what we called it. And uh, nowadays it's known as a learning path. You know, 20-some uh, years later it was renamed and relabeled as a training organization of the 90s became learning organizations and learning and development organizations. Um, which, because they did that, because uh, Senge's book, uh, The Fifth Discipline, was so popular that their managers were wanted to become a learning organization. And so training managers, you know, wanted to become a learning organization too because they didn't understand what their concept was really all about. And so they thought they were the learning organization rather than their entire enterprise. And they were maybe perhaps a means to some of that ends, of course. There's informal learning, there's, you know, giving people access to things other than formal training content to help them climb the learning curve, the performance curve uh, in their particular jobs. But um, so I, I, I made, I, that's when I started my presentations, 84 and 85, and I started doing a lot of presentations. I started off doing one session at every conference, and over time I grew to having two, three, four, I've even had up to five things I've delivered at one conference um, later on in the late 80s and early 90s. Um, so a lot of that was the performance-based curriculum architecture design. I was uh, 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 doing things on project management techniques because of an article that I published in the Chicago Chapters newsletter back in 86. You know, our approach at R.A. Svensson and Associates later becomes Svensson and Wallace, where, um, you know, how did we manage our projects? Well, how did we plan them in the first place? So if you don't have a plan, it's hard to manage to a plan if you don't have a plan. And the old saying is, you know, not having a plan is a plan, just not a very good plan. So we were, we'd plan in detail so that, that I could bid things fixed fee. And this was unusual in the training business back at that time because most people did it time and expense. And when I was a training project supervisor at Motorola, I had lots of vendors working on pr projects for me and I would get change ordered to death. And I hate change orders. And I am very proud to say that since 1982, when I became a consultant, I have yet to give my client a change order for something that was unforeseeable. Now I've had clients expand 
projects after we got started they said hey this is good stuff we need to include these other people and we'd have to do a change order and rewrite a new project plan and submit that to the contracting organization and all that nonsense but um but so i really like the idea of being able to be predictive to be able to say that we're going to run this three-day meeting on these three dates no kidding we're going to have a steering team gate review meeting uh a week or whatever later no kidding and then we're going to go into the next phase and do design and we're going to run a three-day design meeting with the master performers no kidding on these days and then we're going to do the review and even if it's at the cricket market technical level or at the course development addy like level um clients love predictability they want to know that you bid at fixed fee versus time and expense because they always worried about scope creep and there were unscrupulous vendors who used scope creep real or imagine to begin to inflate their lowball bid that they put in to win the business in the first place and then they change order year to death and then all of a sudden their price would be higher than the other guys who might have been doing the same thing or two i've i've experienced so much of that uh lost so much work because of that and had my clients come back and tell me yeah we had to give it to the internal training group because their bid was less but then when the project was done they were three times higher than your fixed fee price so um but it's hard to fight that sometimes within with the politics inside of an organization so you, you we had to contend with that and people still have to contend with that kind of stuff um so i as a chicago uh, chapter member i was traveling so much as a consultant that I didn't get to go to a lot of their meetings. I went to a few, but I couldn't, you know, they were doing them every month uh, throughout the year, I think, without exception. And uh, I maybe attended one or two, uh, probably for about a 10 year window, uh, because I was traveling so much and I was just out of town and I'm not gonna forego billable work because I have a meeting to go to. Um, but the staff members that we had, if they weren't uh, out of town on business, I expected them to go for their professional development to NSPI, my professional home. I wanted it to be their professional home because they would learn, you know, some of the latest, greatest, and some of the things from the past that are still true today. And so we didn't have to reinvent the wheel at great time and expense. We could shortcut that process by learning from the people who so willingly shared at NSPI, at ISPI, and that may be true in other professional organizations um, or not. But at ISPI, I mean, that's how I was raised and, and uh, grew up in that kind of environment. And I learned that uh, part of my role as a member of that community is to share freely with people and help them climb the learning curve, the performance curve, using valid evidence-based practices, basically. Um, anyway, so that's what that's all about. Um, I, uh, so I, I was presenting a cricket architecture design year after year. I think I did three or four years in a row and somebody caught me in the hall and they said, you know, guy, you know, ISD is not just cricket architecture design. And I said, yeah, I know that. But, you know, so I was being kind of, so I started delivering a session on cricket architecture design every other year. So I wasn't doing the same old, same old every year, but that meant I had to have something else to present. And uh, so I started presenting on the project management approaches, how to do project planning, um, and uh, you know how to manage a curriculum architecture once you had one in place. You know what do you need to do to that? Here were, there were applications of designing a maintenance curriculum using performance analysis via a group process. So the whole group process thing was really kind of our our shtick, our bag. Is is how we went about doing our work we could accelerate and reduce the cycle time necessary. The trade-off is, is that you've got to take your top performers out of the work for three days for an analysis meeting and three days for a design meeting. Sometimes it was two and two, sometimes it was two and four, so four and four, you know, so it always varied depending on the scope and the complexity of what we were tackling, how quickly our clients and I, we decided that, you know, how quickly could we bring people to consensus or is that going to be difficult given who the master performers truly are? Are they gruff, you know, wizened old uh, pros who uh, don't tolerate any fools and think their way is the only way and they wouldn't really acknowledge or support other master performers? And so there's, there's a fair amount of that because master performers 
generally have fairly good egos, big egos. They know they're good. They've been told they're good. They're rewarded. They're asked to bail out other people all of the time, which helps them when, when we're tapping into their knowledge, their expertise, and we're trying to figure out, so what about the non-master performers? Where are they missing the mark? Um, these people knew because they had to work and clean up the mess of a lot of non-master performers. So, you know, just, and just because they thought they knew ideal performance and they understood the gap analysis, we knew that that didn't make them right, just because they thought so. Um, but who else would you ask? Um, and if you put eight or ten of them in there and they started fixing each other's gaps and you'd feel like you had a pretty robust set of data, analysis data or design data, um, when you went through these uh, facilitated group processes, and that's what I started calling it, uh, I don't know, 10, 12, 20 years ago, facilitated group process, not just a group process, because one of the secrets of this is having a facilitator knows what the heck they're doing, knows what their terminal outputs are, knows one or many of the means in facilitating a group to get that data that you want and need for your next downstream step, you know, what analysis data do you need to feed design? What design data do you need to feed development? You know, so that you basically are reducing gaps, inadvertent gaps, because master performers, subject matter experts, all of us don't have perfect memories. They won't be able to give us everything. So we gather it with an eye towards filling the gaps, finding the gaps, fixing them as we move forward. So when you're doing analysis, you know, you're doing analysis. When you're doing design, there's a fair amount of that's, that's analysis. When you're doing development, you're continuing to do analysis. When you do pilot testing, uh, you're doing analysis. And then you revise it and release it, and it goes out into the world. And if you're doing evaluation of your content when it's being used out in the real world, you're continuing to do analysis, summative analysis, known as evaluation. So you can do the formative stuff up front and the summative stuff at the end, and uh, um, that will, you know, nothing is perfect, but this gets as close as we think it was possible um, without taking forever and a day. And most clients are in a hurry, and so you have to have some way to do this fairly quickly. So we were able to reduce cycle times, and as uh, anybody who ever paid attention to the work that Gary Rummler did at Motorola when he was doing uh, streamlining, reducing cycle times of business processes, you automatically stripped out a whole bunch of costs. So you get it quicker and you get it fat. So you get it faster, you get it cheaper because you're reducing expenses. And if you really do it right, you'll get it better. So better, faster, cheaper. It comes out of the quality world. So uh, again, you know, I was changing the names on, you know, what do you call doing analysis with the group process? So I've got building models and matrices using a team approach. Um, that was in 92. Um, but so I, I continued again attending all of these conferences, continuing to meet more people who really do an evidence-based approach, the research-based approaches to ISD methodologies. I was getting enlightened about uh, all the uh, other variables to process performance. Uh, that, that's my language, process performance. Others, are, I'm sure, are using it too. But, uh, but. I, w I needed to, when I was doing the gap analysis, to help my clients understand that some of the gaps in performance are not caused by the non-master performer's lack of knowledge and skills. It's primarily due to in deficiencies in the environment, what I call DEs. Now, Tom Gilbert used DE, DK, DI differently. I use, when we're looking at gaps and causes, we would attribute the cause to one of three categories. It's a deficiency of the person, the individual performer's knowledge and skill, or their other attributes and values. Maybe psychologically they're not predisposed to work in a sales role where they get lots of rejection and then they can't handle it, so we've, we have a selection issue. Um, and we need to select people who have the physical requirements, the intellectual requirements, the psychological requirements, the values, personal values that are conducive to the role that they are were hiring for, selecting for. But there's all these other things. You know, as Deming uh, later said, there's 94% of the problems in the workplace in, in the process are due to the system, which is under the control of management, none of the workers. 
And so quit berating workers, you know, management, go fix your stuff here because it's you. So our model is take, I took the Ishikawa diagram a long time ago that said every process is composed of four elements, the four M's they were called, non-PC, non-politically correct, men, materials, machines, and methods. And so, you know, if you got a problem in your process, the output or the process itself, you got to go look at those variables. So I converted the Ishikawa diagram, kind of melded it, merged it with uh, the behavior engineering model stuff of Tom Gilbert, things that uh, Carl Binder would call the six boxes. Uh, Roger, the late Roger Chevalier also uh, uh, was a uh, proponent of the behavior engineering model stuff of Gilbert. Donald Bullock, even before, back in the 80s when I first joined the organization, he was big about uh, Gilbert's work and what he was doing with it in creating training and job aids, um, which is now we're calling job aids performance support or workflow learning um, uh, so that people can get you know micro instructions on what to do now, next, or whatever. Um, but um, so, I, I was, again, I, so in 1995, um, I did an Encore presentation at the uh, NSPI, ISPI, I was an ISPI uh, group then. Uh, I did my first Encore presentation, which meant the year before, my evaluation scores were so high, I was in the top five of all the presentations at the conference. So I was invited to come back and do an Encore presentation, you know, with, with that as part of the label, so that everybody would know this is good stuff and received high marks last year. So come and listen to it again. It was a uh, Encore presentation on performance-based curriculum architecture design. That year I also did my first delivery of strategic alignment of the training and development system. Something I'd been working on with my clients, which was really the, the wheelhouse of Ray Svensson. He, his thing was strategic planning for training and development organizations. Something that he had done at AT&T at the Bell System Center for Technical Education, which is where he was working. Uh, prior to when I met him and he had broken away and started his own consulting firm, but that's what he was doing for Motorola. So he was helping Motorola with their strategic plan and how to set up basically what's what I, I call, and Ray's language is similar, but a governance and advisory system where you formally organize your cl clients and stakeholders so they can tell you what they want you to do now. What to stop doing that they asked for before, but you got to stop it now because they don't, that's not a big deal or it's no longer an issue or do the old stuff that you were doing and add this to your plate um, and how do you work with them to make sure that you're working on their critical business issues and not what some might call the low-hanging fruit we want to focus on high stakes performance high risk high reward and the stuff that's really low stakes low risk low reward we should leave that to what we nowadays know as informal means for learning um, this informal learning thing. Back in 82, when we did curriculum architecture designs, I would tell my clients, okay, now you don't need to put everything in place, right? You should be cherry picking these, this modular curriculum that we designed for you. And some of it you have already and you can use as is. Some of it you have, but you gotta make modifications before it's good to go. And some of this you don't have at all. So there's two opportunities, to, places to invest your money. You know, place your strategic bets for return on investment, improved performance. and But there are things on this path, which includes, theoretically, everything that everybody needs to know, but you don't need to put it all in place. And for those things that you don't fund and put something in place for it, it's a hole in the curriculum. And that will be left to unstructured OJT, unstructured on-the-job training. What we're doing for the user community, the performance community, is we're naming it, but that's all we're gonna do. Now, we also have analysis data that describes, you know, where did that knowledge and skill item or that task set, where, you know, what do, what do we understand about that? So my clients, I encourage them to share the analysis data and the design data that was the foundation for this training and development path, because if we didn't produce content or if they couldn't produce content quickly enough and all you could do was name it, that would create customer dissatisfaction, and that ain't no good. So what we encourage them to do is to share the data, and of course a lot of them didn't do that because they thought, oh, version control, and we'll lose control of this whole thing. Um, so that they 
who were left to their own devices, so to speak, had something to fall back on. Our original analysis data that called out these things that were either low priority or zero priority to the project steering team, the client and the stakeholders, who would say, uh, here's the high priorities, here's the medium priorities, here's the low priorities, and the guy said, well, what about the zero? Where, you know, we'll get to the low priorities eventually, but, you know, are there things that you want to tag right now that you never want to see us spend another nickel on? And that's unstructured OJT, now informal learning. However, informal learning today is, you know, we think that people can use performance support job aids, but that's a formal approach unless they found a, a just happenstance, found a YouTube video or, or something out there on the internet that might help them with strategic planning or whatever their tasks might be. Um, it may not be authentic content, authentic enough, and what we know about near and far transfer is that maybe only 5 to 15 percent of the people can learn something out of context and transfer it to new context. So the issue with informal learning, um, unless it's social learning by somebody who knows what they're doing and they can teach you unstructured coaching, if you will, um, so without any more guidance, or you could structure the coaching if it was important enough and high risk and high reward enough. But um, so, uh, you know, I, those are the kinds of things that uh, that I learned from my association with this, with my professional home. Um, so I did a lot of uh, formal presentations, the 90-minute presentations, the 60-minute presentations. Uh, NSPI, ISPI used to do a thing called Cracker Barrel until the restaurant chain decided that they didn't like people reusing this before there ever was a Cracker Barrel restaurant, as far as I know. But we used to do these Cracker Barrels. So, but if we go to New York City, it was called the Apple Barrel. Um, and uh, that's when uh, small groups of tables, you'd have 15, 20 minutes to talk about your thing, answer anybody's questions, give them handouts, and, and then they would get up and go get uh, wine and cheese or bagels and coffee and then go to the next table and they do maybe three or four of these in a row. Um, and so I've started doing those as well and dealing uh, with a smaller target audience, you know, a table that seated me and maybe 11 other people at most, um, and share, you know, how we did things. It's kind of like working out loud. It's maybe there's a lag in that, but you're, but what we would do is we would share, this is exactly how we do it. You might be able to do this on your own without us and, or maybe you want to hire us to do that. And so we would give away to sell. It was, you know, marketing, if you will. And everybody that's at these conferences presenting is marketing either the products and services that they have to sell or simply the brand of them. They may be working in a corporation, but it's really all about them building their own personal brand, their professional brand. And so, you know, we all do that. And that's what they get for sharing their expertise, the secrets sauce, the, uh, the tricks of the trade that they've come up with that work. Um, and then you can learn from others that way. So it was a great device and I enjoyed participating in that. Um, I've done 34 presentations to date here in April of 2020. I've done 34 presentations at NSPI and ISPI chapters. Sometimes it was a one or two day workshop, or most often it was an uh, evening program. Um, I've done webinars for the chapters. I've done them for other, a you know, ASCD, ATD, um, for the, I've presented at Lakewood conferences, which was associated with Training Magazine back in the day. Now it's just the Training Magazine conference, and I've spoken at that one too. Um, but so, uh, um, but ISPI is really where I uh, put myself to the test presenting to people who often knew much more than I did, uh, were steeped in the research, uh, taught this at the university level. And so, you know, I took feedback from those people seriously uh, as part of my continued development, even though I was doing things that really seemed to work. You know, I was, I, I'm not educated in the field formally. So I've often, you know, I didn't feel such a pretender because I was having great success with clients and getting a repeat business from them on highly critical performance in their organization. So I felt good about that, but I didn't know how it squared or not with the research. And I relied on people at ISPI, NSPI before that, to help guide me on the straight and narrow evidence-based path. 
And when I deviated from that, but it seemed to work, you know, I was given encouragement that, you know, not everything has been subjected to research. So there are things that we know work under certain conditions and don't work under other conditions. And we know there's other things that don't work at all, regardless of the conditions. And there's all this other stuff, practices that are evolving that no one is really sure uh, under what conditions exactly does it work. You know, it may be working for Guy under the conditions that he's using it, but uh, will it work here, there, and everywhere? And so nobody knows. So what I liked about NSPI, ISPI is that they would embrace emerging practices that had not been subjected to research or, pretend, or perhaps candidates for future research, but hadn't been done yet. So I and others were encouraged to continue to share, even if there was no research basis, even if you couldn't cite, you know, the research and the experts and what they've written about this and before. And this is particularly important with emergent technologies. Now we've got to be wary of all that and we've got to really do our evaluation to see are we having a meaningful impact? Is our the impact that we're providing our clients, is that greater than the investment costs? You know, or are they going negative every time they use our stuff? You know, something to be a little bit concerned about, unless of course you're unscrupulous and you're selling snake oil. Uh, and unfortunately there's too much of that. <clears throat> um, in 2000, I was invited to be a part of uh, uh, what ISBI used to use to kick off their conferences. It was a 99 seconds is what they called it, hosted by uh, uh, Civil Asylum uh, Tiagarajan. Uh, some of you know him as Tiagi, but he would always do this and there'd be the big timer going on and he would uh, ring a bell or blow a horn or blow the Tiagi whistle. Many of you know what that means. Um, when the 99 seconds was up and uh, most people couldn't get it done in the 99 seconds unless they went up there deliberately to do a 30 second thing and then would turn around and watch the clock count down until their time was up and then they walk off the stage knowing that they've been successful. So it kind of became a game for many of us though to see how much we could squeeze in. How much could we shovel out to the audience in that 99 second window? And I'm uh, uh, sad to say that of the many times that I was able to do that, I wasn't capable of getting it done in, in 99 seconds. But I brought up the one in 2000 because that one is video. It was videotaped uh, and I've shared that online. So that's on YouTube. So you can go see me and I think 25 other people that were all part of this 99 second kickoff of a conference. And that was in the year 2000. Um, I, uh, I, 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 I started publishing uh, more often in the late 90s. Um, I started doing some publications in uh, local chapter stuff. My chapter, some other chapters uh, were interested in content uh, for their local newsletter, monthly or bi-monthly or whatever it was. And, uh, but I started writing more in earnest and I was publishing in the journal for qual uh, Quality and Participation, I think it was called. Now it's part of ASQ, the American Society for Quality, who doesn't, just goes by ASQ nowadays. Um, they're international, global, you know. And uh, so, but I, but I started writing, and so I started writing more and more for um, uh, and ISPI and publishing in their Performance Improvement Journal, uh, peer-reviewed uh, kind of a journal. And I also wrote uh, the softer, lighter stuff in their news and notes, which is now called Performance Express. But uh, it didn't go through the rigor of a review. Uh, but anyway, so I was publishing uh, lighter pieces there. But the you know little tips and tricks and things that I had been learning that I wanted to share. So again, you know, kind of working out loud with a lag. Uh, uh, you didn't have to be there to hear me talk about it. You could go read about it because that's how we used to have to do it back in the day before YouTube and all of that. Um, I was invited in 2001 to do a master series presentation at the conference, which I did on push-pull uh, performance-based knowledge management systems. So to me, whether it's training, instruction learning, or knowledge management, it's all about trying to capture the, what people know, how, you know, what they have to know in order to be able to do. And so knowledge management is just another means to that ends of capturing that and making it accessible 
or pushing it out or you know allowing people to pull from it as they need it um, and so I saw this overlap and I felt that there most of the stuff I was hearing about knowledge management was a lot of knowledge that didn't seem to be connected to tasks and outputs performance in other words just capturing knowledge for the sake of knowledge and and to me that's that's a bad investment to go that route. You really need to have your eye on the ball of performance as you're looking at what are the knowledge and skills, what are the emerging uh, things, technologies and, and knowledge and skills that go along with that to affect task performance and the production of worthy outputs. Um, so uh, again, and that the next year in 2001, I did another 99 second thing that didn't get recorded to my knowledge, or if it did, it's in a warehouse someplace because no one can seem to find a, some of these old gems. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so up again, I was doing a lot of that kind of stuff, curriculum architecture, doing performance. Uh, the uh, Ray Svensson and Karen and Guy Wallace approach to analysis. I was doing it differently than Ray and Karen were because I was streamlining and refining my approach to doing performance analysis and knowledge and skill analysis all to feed either curriculum architecture level ISD or ADI level ID. See, I would apply instructional systems design ISD at the curriculum architecture level where you're looking at the entire set of instruction as a system to train people to do their jobs. ADI ID works at tackling some components of that and teaching people how to do a task set and a worthy output or several outputs and the tasks related to those things and the associated knowledge and skills. Um, but anyways, that's my own spin on that language and it's certainly not uh, universally embraced. Um, so I continue doing a lot of presentations, a lot, a lot of writing, a lot of giving back uh, to my society. In uh, 1999, when I finally published the book that I had started in 1983, uh, I went, I, I, I called up Gary Rumler, who was screening his calls. I left my message, and before I hung up, he picked up the phone. And uh, sometimes he'd have to call me back because I'd be quick at hanging up. But he was there on the phone. I think by then maybe I was even waiting for to see if he was going to pick up. And he did, and I said, hey, I've uh, written this book, and I finally got it to the point like I'd, I'd like to... Uh, get your thoughts on it, uh, and I think you might be concerned. I was trying to heighten his concern so that he might be interested in reviewing my book. I said, you know, I've attributed uh, my approach to performance analysis to what I learned uh, back in 1979, because um, I learned a derivative of a derivative of the Rumler approach to doing analysis. And so I've said that in the book, and you might decide that that's okay with you, or you might decide that you want me to exclude any reference to you because you don't want to be associated with this cramp. And uh, he laughed and he said, okay, well, why don't you come down here to Tucson and visit with me for a day or two? And uh, we'll talk, well, you can walk me through your book and then I'll think about, you know, uh, my reaction to it. And I said, oh, and maybe you'll give me a marketing quote or something like that. And he said, oh, sure. So I went and visited him. I spent two days with him and we walked through the book uh, I left the book with him. It was a draft copy and a three-ring binder. And uh, uh, it was a week or so later that he wrote me, uh, emailed me, and sent me a new design for the cover of the book, which he did not like, with a new title. And uh, my organization put that in their newsletter and said, okay, here's Guy's version, here's Gary Rummer's version vote on it and we'll select from all the people that vote on one or the other and you'll win a free book and uh, I don't think we got very many I think it was less than a dozen or so something like that and uh, his won out and I knew that even if his hadn't received more votes I was going to honor him by making the change maybe I wasn't too sure when we uh, published our newsletter with a little contest in it but um, <clears throat> but anyway so he gave me a great marketing quote on that um, you know, if, uh, if you don't want to be a little red schoolhouse and you don't want to approach training that way, then you should read this book, something like that. Anyway, you can read the quote if you want. It's all over the, my website and the book. But anyway, so so I changed the cover, changed the title, um, finally got the book out, um, self-published it, 
in 99, I needed to self-publish so that I could own the content and update it and use that content anywhere I wanted. And it was, that A version was not owned by some uh, book publisher um, who could tell me that, no, I couldn't update the book. They didn't want it to see that happen. Now, that happened to my business partner, Ray Svensson, earlier back in the 80s. And so I was always worried about, you know, going with an established publisher. The, the, if you went with them, they'd do the marketing. Hopefully, you'd sell a lot more books, get your name out there, your methodology out there, maybe lead them to business. Um, but the trade-off was you didn't really own that version of the content anymore. They owned what they published. And I didn't like the, that notion, so I went my own way. Um, back also in uh, 98, I decided I was going to run for the board at the national level, at the international level. And so I ran for the board of directors, and I, I won. And so I served uh, 99 through 2000 under the with the, with Dale Brethauer was was the president at the time, and our Dale is a great friend of Gary Rumler's going back to their days at Michigan. Um, they created some models that are kind of universal to the whole HPT, human performance technology thing, or whatever you want to call HPT. Um, but so it was, I really enjoyed my time working with Dale, very sharp guy, uh, has always been willing to share and to guide people. And then I worked for his president-elect, John Swinney, who was my, one of my clients at, uh, at Bandag. And anyway, so I enjoyed uh, working with John. And then I decided that I w wanted to become president of the society because I had a, uh, a mission uh, that I wanted to undertake. I wanted to help the society clarify what the heck is HPT anyway. Uh, our awards at the time were awards for instruction and non-instruction. And if you remember what I said about Deming, 94% of the problems are due to the system. That's not individual, so it's not got anything to do with knowledge and skills and training or instruction or learning. It's got to do with all the other variables in the performance process context. And so I wanted, and so I would go around asking people, okay, do you think that uh, Six Sigma, is that part of HPT? Is it inside the box, outside the box? What are you thinking? Answers were all over the place because nobody really knew what HPT included other than instruction for sure and other things. You know, motivation incentives, more people would have said, yes, that goes to the box. Six Sigma? I don't think so, guy. Yet there were many Six Sigma practitioners that attended the national conference to learn about the, this broader approach to performance improvement than Six Sigma. I mean, Six Sigma is all about reducing variation in the process to reduce variation in the product uh, to meet the customer requirements. But, uh, you know, there's other variables that Six Sigma couldn't as easily reduce the variation of. You know, the human being is one huge variable that if I come in depressed one day and happy the next and distracted one day and paying attention the next, my performance is gonna vary and my knowledge and skills and the environment, the context didn't change. It was me, I was changing. And so that's, I'm the loose cannon in the process. And uh, how do you begin to deal with that? Well, Six Sigma practitioners had to contend with that too, because normally they're not working on lights out factories where there's no human beings involved. There's humans, you know, usually typically strewn up and down the process. And so how do we begin to control and reduce the variation in people? And so that's why a lot of them came to ISPI to learn about that. Um, and so I thought, yeah, Six Sigma and Lean should be part of that. In fact, if you look at the work of Gary Rumler uh, in his latter decades, he was all about really what's called Lean. Less so in Six Sigma, but in Lean and streamlining processes and reducing cycle times and reducing costs and being smart about handoffs and were handoffs unnecessary, you know, instead of handing off an output you know, to the next three people for them to do their thing. Why not collapse all of that and have one person do it all? It doesn't sit in anybody's inbox. It gets handled and done. And if we've sized the organization right and the number of people in certain job slots, uh, we can accelerate performance, process performance, and improve quality. And so get it done better, faster, and cheaper. You know, the, the, the goal of, if you will, TQM, total quality management. So 
I saw a marriage of TQM and HPT. Uh, Ray Svensson and my wife Karen and I wrote a book, the total, uh, or the quality roadmap, and that was really the merge, uh, the merger or marriage of TQM and uh, HPT, Human Performance Technology, or Performance Improvement, or again, whatever you want to call it. But uh, so we saw a merging of that, and of course, Motorola saw that too, because when they created Six Sigma, they bought or licensed the intellectual property of Gary Wellner in order to create Six Sigma. So an HPT orientation is at the root of Six Sigma. You take Gary, Pro Gary Rummler's uh, process orientation and you create a process for doing improvement and you can bring in all the appropriate TQM tools and techniques of which there were dozens and dozens and dozens if not hundreds um, and figure out where do you use these in your overall approach. Is it at the beginning of the improvement approach, in the middle or at the end or throughout or what? Or under what types of improvements are you making would you use some of these uh, quality improvement methodologies. Um, so uh, so I became president, I got elected president-elect. <clears throat> Jim Hill and I had uh, uh, discussed, you know, who should run first. He said, you know, I know you're going to run, I want to run. Uh, why don't we flip a coin and see who's going to go first? And I said, well, wait a minute, why don't you just go first? I'll run after you and I'll be your president-elect but you've got to help me with this initiative that I want to undertake. And he said, sure he would. And I actually got Judy Hale, who was the president before Jim Hill, to agree to let me start this initiative. So I called up Gary Rumler, and I'm sure he was doing the phone screening, and he picked up the phone and I said, hey Gary, uh, uh, I'm going to run for the ISBI presidency, and I think I've got a pretty good shot at it. And uh, This is what I want to do. I want to do a project, an initiative, that eventually became labeled as Clarifying HPT. What's inside the box? What's not? You know, how do we grow people in that? You know, let's really define what it is. Um, and because you had written this article that was published by NSPI back in 1983, and it talked about how to define performance technology or human performance technology, and rather than approach it by defining it using a couple of paragraphs or, or more, why don't we define it in terms of the technology domains? Smart band. So there's instructional technology. There's motivation incentives technology, if you will. There's process improvement technology. He used slightly different language for that 1983 article, but I said, I'd like to revive that 83 article here in 2002, 19 years later, and I would like to use that and define HPT using these performance technologies. And I wanna do a society-wide thing. I wanna tell people what we're gonna do, get their input on the front end, form a team of 20, 25 people. Uh, the, you know, the, the usual suspects when you do an initiative like that, you know, but I will also want new people that aren't considered part of the usual suspects, the gurus, if you will. So, you know, that was a political thing and, you know, that may have hurt me a little bit because I, there were people that, you know, could have, should have been on it, but weren't because there was a limited number of seats. And how many people do you want to facilitate? Uh, uh, John Sweeney agreed to be the uh, um, uh, the champion of this, uh, be a member of the task force group, the core group that was going to do this. Uh, my former business partner, uh, Ray Svensson, agreed he would be the facilitator of this team of 25 people. And if there was anybody that could facilitate a group of big ego 25 people, it would be Ray Svensson. Now, I think I could have done it too, but this was my initiative. So I needed to, you know, be a member of the team and not the leader forcing my uh, views and opinions down everybody's throat, because, you know, that wouldn't go very far. Um, so Ray agreed to do that, John and I did that. So the three of us worked on this, set this whole thing up and ran it. Gary Rumler contributed. We kicked, we kicked off the whole thing with an article, you know, looking back and looking forward, and he wrote, an article. He, he and I wrote an article and we, we used his old article, republished that, which is why I called him to say, do I have your permission to republish this article and do this? And oh, by the way, would you help me? And he said something to the kin of, you're effing crazy guy, but yeah, I'll help you. But you're crazy. You know, I tried this, you know, 20 years ago and, uh, you know, nothing happened and I don't, you know, think it's going to go very far. Well, 
we got it up running, we had the thing, we came up with uh, professional communities, pro-coms as they called them, got a lot of pushback from people who said, you know, uh, uh, communities of practice, they're organic, they just kind of sprout up where they're needed and you can't top down design these things. Well, it wasn't really a community of practice. It was a homeroom for people where we could share evidence-based practices, what the research shares within that group, but we could send people from one homeroom who may be interested about some of these other solution sets, if you will. You know, if you're in training, maybe you want to learn a little bit about incentives and motivation. Maybe you want to learn a little bit about process improvement. You may not want to necessarily become a, an expert steeped in that practice, but you need to know a little bit about it so that you can look for problems in performance, the gaps and the causes, and have a clue as to what solutions are out there that might be appropriate to address your client's needs. That was my vision, that was my goal to do that. We got the whole thing up and running, and then the paid staff of the society uh, didn't seem to be very interested in helping us implement it and it, it died a multi-year slow and painful death with a lot of grousing of people because they put in you know uh, uh, home rooms if you will digital home rooms for people to meet and go at but but uh, where you were going to go in there and write things and share things with other people that had signed up to be part of that little professional community there wasn't an editing function and so people groused about that and i said okay go write your stuff up in in word or word perfect or whatever and then cut and paste it and put it in there. Well, they didn't like that. And so we put in a really clunky, stupid tool that wasn't anywhere near up to date in terms of what other people were used to on the leading edge of these more sophisticated uh, internet tools. And so that was an issue, uh, that, but they named the tracks in the conference and that lasted, I don't know, maybe 15 years. And then that seems to be dissipating the last conference that I paid attention to, attention to um, uh, used some of the, the names of the professional communities for the tracks because they make sense. And, a, and a, you know, a large number of people were involved in you know, framing this. You know, yeah, you could have framed it some other way, but this is one way to frame it that has a logic to it. It's somewhat intuitive. Uh, people can gravitate to things where they want to learn a little bit more so we could give them the beginner level of stuff for incentives and motivation or intermediate or advanced if they really wanted to get steeped in all of that. So that was the intent to broaden the tent of what human performance technology is and is known as beyond instruction and non-instruction. Um, <clears throat> so uh, that kind of reminds me of an initiative. I, I won an award in 1989 with my client AT&T Network Systems and we didn't win the big prize. We were, you know, ran, we got the second tier prize. And I was told, I don't think I even asked, I think I was told outright, well, you know, AT&T won the big prize last year, so we can't have them win this year. Well, one, this was a different part of AT&T, which was a big organization. Um, this was for the old Western Electric Group Network Systems that built the equipment for the network, but they didn't operate it or, uh, but, and, uh, so I, that was not a satisfactory explanation for why we didn't win. We had a great return on investment that had been calculated by the financial organization of AT&T Network Systems because they weren't gonna allow us to go out there and make any wild claims about the return on investment. So the financial organization was part of the assessment my client did, and we came up with like 475% return on investment in a 18 month window or something like that. We had gotten people up the learning curve and up the performance curve much quicker. Um, and this was not uh, objective hard data, which would be hard to do. This was more subjective. What did managers and peers think about people who had gone through the training and how quickly they came up to speed? Um, so, you know, our measurement systems are, are not easy to put in place and in complicated performance where there's so many other people and variables, the marketplace itself, you know, how well your product and services that you're running the market, you know, all these issues here, it's hard to distill exactly what contribution did training or instruction or learning make to terminal performance out there in the real world. Um, but anyway, so that took me on a kick to go and uh, join the awards committee. And I went to the board and I said, you know, this is terrible. 
In fact, when I talk to people about this terrible situation, they all ask, why are we doing norm referenced approaches to giving out awards? Shouldn't we be criterion referenced? Which means if everybody meets the criteria, they too win. None of this criterion referenced and then a beauty contest, the norm reference thing to pick the, the, the best of it all. When there was less logic to how that was determined when it was really somewhat political. And uh, that didn't sit well with me. And so I was encouraged by many people when I took this over because I made a lot of noise about why I was taking it over because I didn't want people to be uh, uh, misunderstand my intent. I wanted to revamp the whole darn thing here and make it criterion reference. So anybody whose projects that were submitted met all the criteria for good work uh, that were established by the committee would would win and there would be none of this first place and then the second tier of also rands if you will or whatever anyway so <clears throat> it's often how, often how I get into writing articles and getting myself involved in these kinds of things is that something annoys the hell out of me and so I go try to do something about it rather than just grouse although I do a fair amount of grousing too um, so this whole thing with on um, this initiative to HPT then was kind of the same thing here. I was getting really tired of the fact that, you know, we couldn't seem to grow the society. We couldn't seem to really market what it is. You know, if you, I, I would tell people, you know, if you went to the, if you went to the Ford Motor Company and said, we got this thing called HPT, it's really cool. We've got case studies after case studies of people applying this and having significant returns on their investments. They're going to say, well, we've got this Six Sigma thing going here, and we've booked millions of dollars of savings, guy. And so, you know, thanks, but no thanks. We've got this under control. And I do darn, darn well for my exposure to TQM back at Motorola in 81 and 82, um, that TQM didn't address everything. And in fact, the, the, the human at component in process performance was not addressed at all very well. Um, and so I thought there, there needed to be this merger and all of this. Um, anyway, so um, it, it's a sad, sad story here. I did this investment. Uh, one of the sayings that I have about NSPI, going back to when it was NSPI, and it was still true then when it became ISPI, was that no organization has wasted more of my time than ISPI. However, on the other hand, no organization has given me more in my professional development than ISPI. And there's the dilemma. Um, so, so I wanted to make improvements in my professional home and what they did and what they even called it. And I wanted them to be able to market HPT more successfully and to be able to say where I was hoping this was go is that yes, Lean and Six Sigma are part of the big umbrella of HPT. HPT is a huge umbrella and it tackles anything and everything that affects performance at the worker level, people, at the work level, process, at the workplace level, organizational performance, and at what Roger Kaufman would call mega at the world level. Uh, maybe better known outside of the ISPI network as uh, being socially responsible. How can organizations, enterprises, uh, do good stuff, you know, give the shareholder a fair return on their investments, but not pollute the planet? Because we only got one, and uh, we're going to run out of places to live and breathe if we don't stop that nonsense. Don't mean to get political, but there you go. Um, so, uh, so in... So my time as president uh, ended in uh, 2004 at the April conference. That April conference in Tampa Bay was my conference. As the, the, the president gets to pick the keynote speakers. Uh, we were facing what uh, seemed to be some financial issues. And so I reached out to somebody that I had met at Motorola in, eight, in 81, Neil Rackham of Spin Selling fame. And I said, Neil, uh, I'm the president of ISBI. He said, congratulations. He used to be a member way back in, in the uh, uh, 70s um, before he really, you know, 
got the spin thing out with Motorola, and then the, the book came out, and it was very popular. And I got him, I got him work in two of my clients, AT and Network Systems and Siemens uh, Building Technologies. I think before even they they took that name on back when they were MCC Powers or Powers Landis and Gears. I can't remember, um, but I got him in there because I wanted. Uh, I did a sales curriculum for uh, Siemens Building Technologies for the sales managers and for the sales people and I talked about spin and my client George West was very intrigued he uh, knew something about the spin thing and I said well I know Neil Rackham why don't you know why don't I uh, arrange for you two guys to meet and you can explore this further because uh, my organization can help you develop the case studies the spin case studies for you know the practice exercises uh, in the training, you know, we can customize it to your products and services. So you're not how learning how to sell, you know, washing machines or snow sleds or something. You know, we can make it more authentic for your people. Maybe you do need to learn on something that's not so authentic initially, but soon you need to move into something that's real world and authentic for the learners, so they don't feel like they're learning somebody else's job. Um, but. Uh, so I asked Neil if he would, I said, you know, would you would you be my keynote speaker? And he said, oh, sure. And I said, ah, about, I've been looking and I, I got this uh, thing online here and it says that uh, your speaking fees are like $18,000. And he goes, oh, I'll waive that for you. You know, I was looking for a discount, not, you know, discount the whole thing away. And I said, oh, well, okay, so what do you require? And he said, well, just give me a first class airline ticket and, uh, you know, put me up in a nice room in the hotel where you're gonna be. And so we did that and he spoke for free. And I asked him if he would, you know, add a couple things to his keynote, things that I saw him do at Motorola in 1981. And one of those was to, uh, we were dealing with some of my manufacturing operations manager clients and they were a gruff crowd. They, they call themselves the uh, belch, fart and scratch crowd at Motorola. And uh, they weren't, you know, degreed engineers because that Motorola was chock full of engineers. Um, but uh, they're the ones who actually made things happen. They made the products and shipped it. And uh, so they were skeptical of seeing Neil Rackham, you know, uh, 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 with his British accent and his goatee and his three piece, you know, suit, lo looking very British, sounding very British. And they were skeptical as hell of him. And so he was talking about, um, you know, what, you know, his approach to things and what he might bring to their needs. And he was at one point, you know, he could see, I could see that, you know, they were kind of not, not buying it, you know, they were, you know, resisting it. And he said, uh, so for example, uh, do any of you play golf or tennis? You know, and every one of them, every one of them did, you know, some of them played both. He goes, oh, did you ever, you ever take a lesson? Most of them had. He said, did they ever, did the instructor ever get you to try to change your grip? course that's a universal truth if you're taking golf or <laughs> tennis lessons uh, one of the things that the instructor is going to do almost for sure is change your grip because you probably got the wrong one which is limiting your ability to do ball control but what happens he said uh, when you change your grip what happened what happened to the ball and they thought about it you know for you know this much time and they said oh it went all over the damn place I didn't have any control at all he said so what'd you do and you know they thought about it he said and they didn't come up with an answer because they probably knew they were guilty and he said i bet you reverted back to your old grip and they said yeah because we had some control with that we didn't have any control with the new grip and he goes all right so that's the importance of coaching coaches need to reinforce behavior and ignore the initial results because if you try to change somebody's behavior they're going to have the equivalent of a loss of ball control, which is going to impact results. So they're going to be looking at their own results and they're going to see it's not as good as it used to be. So they're going to revert back and you've wasted all your time and money and effort on training. So the job of a coach post training is to reinforce the new behaviors that you taught them to use. And eventually the results will become self-rewarding and reinforcing of the new behavior the new grip and you know what that made all sorts of sense to them but the kicker on the whole thing I love telling the story so he's got these three you know he's got these these people who you know self-proclaimed belch fart and scratch crowd and all of a sudden he's flipped them entirely 
he's got them in his hand, in his pocket. He could have asked them to do anything and they would have done it because they were so, but the icing on the cake was that he reaches into his three-piece suit and pulls out a little medieval flute. And I forget the proper name for it. And he starts playing it, you know, and it's just like you're watching a movie from, you know, old England. And it's, he played it beautifully. And he stops after, you know, 15, 20, 30 seconds of playing this thing. And he stops and he says, you know, I'm not very good. And they're all, you're all, we're all, I'm too sitting there going, what are you talking about? That was beautiful. And he said, yeah. So my instructor says, my problem is, is that I never raise my fingers high enough. And I'm lazy. I got lazy fingers and I don't raise them high enough off of the holes in the flute. I don't know the proper terminology. Um, and therefore, I'll, I'll be limiting my capabilities here. I'll never really get good. So I still go and get lessons. I've been taking these lessons for X number of years, he said. And recently I saw him in 2020, back in February, and he was still taking lessons. And because uh, we reminisced about that story. So he's at the keynote in 2004, in April 2004, and he's up on stage and he's got his little flute, he pulls it out and he plays it and he tells the whole story just like it was back there at uh, M-Tech back in 1981. And he talks about the importance of reinforcing the newly learned behaviors. And if our instructional efforts, if our training efforts, learning efforts, don't include that components, component of instruction is back on the job the reinforcement that's needed, um, giving feedback, focusing on the new behaviors and ignoring the initial results because it's the equivalent of loss of ball control, but eventually those new behaviors will produce results that will become reinforcing of the behaviors, but initially not so at all with rare exception. And so it's necessary to do I believe what Susan Markle called, or uh, excuse me, Karen Brethauer called maintenance maintenance of the new behaviors because if you taught people new behaviors in the classroom or wherever they were able to exhibit them and show you that they got them then they go out to the real world with more variables and more issues than you could have ever replicated in training simulation or not um, they're going to face those and they're going to have the equivalent of loss of ball control and so therefore they're going to begin to revert to what that used to work what's more comfortable for them because this new stuff is not comfortable and so there's this need to do this maintenance uh, and to reinforce it. And if it's something that's done all the time, well, eventually the performance will start reinforcing and people will, will continue the new behaviors and enhance them and grow and continue their learning. But if it's something that they do infrequently and they go to try the newfangled behaviors out six months after they learn them or after they first did them, but it only happens every six months or so, then they're going to struggle with it. They're going to forget some of it. They're not going to quite do it right. They may get lousy results and then they'll revert back to what they think works best, which may or may not be valid, may or may not have the same impact. They may get better results, but they will be limited. They'll limit their own capability to perform at a higher level because they're not using quite the right behaviors. And by behaviors, I do mean, you know, the physical behaviors, and the cognitive behaviors, if you will. So it's the, the being able to do things and to be able to think about it, making decisions, discriminations, um, planning. Um, you know, so what goes on in our heads is often hard to tease out, but that's what Neil's approach to mastery and having a, 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 a mastery model that guides you. Something that's been proven to work and now we need to train everybody to do what we've learned can work under a variety of authentic real world, you know, conditions. Uh, if the whole world's on fire, it may not work, but so there's gonna be a limit to that. But if under typical conditions and, and be robust to some of the, you know, once in a blue moon conditions, but if it happens every 3000 years, you know, we're not, we're not gonna be able to prepare people for that. However, some experts, because of all their experience, may be able to handle that problem that comes up every 3000 years and do it successfully. Of course, then we need to, capture that from them and share that with everybody else, but probably not for another 2,999 years. Um, so I, I continued uh, supporting ISPI after I left 
the presidency. I wrote uh, 12 months worth of articles in 2012 and basically did an update to my book Lean ISD and published that through uh, the society's uh, less formal um, it wasn't their performance improvement journal, it was uh, their either News and Notes or Performance Express, which is their e-newsletter. So I, I did that. I uh, co-founded the Charlotte, North Carolina chapter of ISPI with uh, Dick Hanshaw. Uh, he and I uh, got together, somebody recommended that I re recommended to him that he invite me to present at one of his annual conferences. So I came in and spoke to a bunch of his clients. and. 2008 and we went to have lunch or dinner afterwards and we talked about ISPI and uh, ASTD had a big thriving chapter but he said it you know it's different and it is and in all fairness it is and uh, nothing wrong with them but you know it, ISPI has got a different you know foci uh, performance and uh, the research and uh, we're less interested in delivery and instructional instructor techniques and things like that and that's a shame that ISPI has kind of poo-pooed that and shoved that to the side, but you know, they were really focused on more of the front end of an instructional design process, if you will, the especially the analysis component of that, and then at the back end, the evaluation of that. Um, but Dick Hanshaw and I talked about ISPI. We started meeting to, uh, to we went to the uh, Carolinas chapter in the Raleigh-Durham area, we talked to the leadership there and said, we're th we're we want to start a chapter, but we don't want to compete with you. We don't want to cannibalize your attendance by having something, you know, two and a half hours away for some people. Depending on what side of each town you lived on, it could have been a five hour drive or a two and a half hour drive. Um, and they were struggling and they said, no, we encourage you to do this. I, we said, you know, you guys are doing things every other month. We'll do things every other month and not compete with you and people can go see both. Well, they eventually shut down in our first year of operation in 2009, and we started in September, and we invited uh, that guy, Civil Asylum, Tiagi uh, you know, Tiagi, to come in and do the first evening uh, session, and then do a full day workshop the next day. And uh, we had Tiagi come in several times over the years since 2009 to uh, do that with him, because he's always a big draw. And we wanted to draw a lot of attention to this new chapter, and then we brought in Judy Hale for the next uh, two months later for the next program. And uh, Judy Hale is always a big draw as well. So we were trying to really prime the pump, if you will. That's an old school talk. Um, and get uh, everybody's attention, get them to come in. Uh, we, our membership fees were $25 uh, a year. If you were a student, it was $5 a year. And, you know, I was make, trying to make the case that if we get a student to join, we should pay them $5 a year if they come. Um, just to be different and to be able to market that, you know, you come as a student and you attend X number of sessions throughout a year here, we'll pay you $5. You know, so your membership is free and we'll give you 5 bucks. Um, not that that would change too many people's minds, but it would draw attention to us, which is what we want to do. We started off fabulously. Uh, we immediately grew membership from zero to, I think we were just under 150 after two or three months. The organization is, has changed. The numbers of members have gone down as they have gone across all professional societies, at, mostly at the uh, national, international level and at local chapter levels, because there's too much competition from the internet. Now you can go get the same kind of content off the internet. You know, you can either watch a YouTube video of some guru speaking or you can see them speak at a local chapter. Uh, so the chapters had to do something a little bit different. They had to have, you know, create a community of practice, if you will, um, allow networking and social learning to happen besides bringing in formal programs. But we had to make sure that the programs had to be top tier so that people would come. And we tried to keep our prices as low as possible I think uh, I went off to a 20-month project in Toronto in 2013, so in 2012 I kind of fell away from the chapter, but they had $10,000 in the bank at that point um, because we had such great attendance, because we had such great speakers, because Dick and I knew people that we could cajole, encourage, entice to come into Charlotte, North Carolina and uh, come and speak to our chapter. And we follow what we call the Tiagi model, which means you come in 
and do an evening presentation. We pay you all your expenses, but nothing else. If you come in and do a workshop with us, we'll split after we pay all of our expenses, we'll split what's left over. So we're a nonprofit, but we generate this profit and we'd split it with the speaker. So that would encourage them to help us market it, uh, encourage them to give us uh, articles or whatever we needed to do, again, to prime the pump and put it into our newsletter and circulate it as that way as we marketed our programs every other month. And so that's how we started up and Dick Hanshaw and I wrote a book. It's available through my website or, uh, but it's the startup story for Charlotte ISBI, something like that. Anyway, you can find it uh, in, on my website with the other, you know, four, five, six hundred resources I offer for free there. Um, so I continued with that, but I went off at, in two, after, in 2013, did this 20 month project. I couldn't go to the 2013 ISPI meeting, which meant in my 34th opportunity, I'd only been to 31, and the next year I was still busy on that project up in Toronto, and I didn't go to the next annual conference, and things were changing in the leadership. Um, you know, who am I to judge, but I wasn't really comfortable with what they were doing. I felt we missed the boat by not promoting a broader um, sense of what HPT was all about. We didn't continue to uh, encourage the professional communities as they were known to, to really pull together the top research in their domain and share that with their members freely. It just kind of fell apart and it was because of a lack of support and resistance from many others. Now, what I came to conclude is that if you thought you were a master in human performance technology, then when Guy and that group came up with this new model for it, you would discover that you are not the renaissance man or woman that you thought you were. You probably maybe know instruction up and down and maybe even motivation and incentives, but what do you know about Six Sigma and Lean and other process improvement techniques? Because there's, of course, way more than just that. There's you know quality function deployment. There's design of experiments. I mean, there's all, hundreds of quality tools that you would need to learn about and know enough to at least call somebody an expert in to use that for you if that's what uh, would address your root issues. Um, and so not everybody that was maybe perceived to be a guru at ISPI and a master of all things HPT, they couldn't be a master anymore because we'd, uh, we'd added more chairs to the musical chairs here and maybe you, you know, your throne was a couple of those, but you didn't master all of it. And that was okay with me. I mean, I was challenged by Dick Clark in 2002 when I was putting together the, the broader task force as, uh, you know, guy, this could go two ways. This could be more expansive or it could narrow it. And if you narrow it, it's going to go back to being programmed instruction on computers and, and live instructor led, and it's going to be training. And it won't even include the incentives and motives that, you know, were part of his wheelhouse besides instruction. And, uh, I said, no, you know, my goal, my hope, my desire, but I don't have final say on this, is to broaden our tent and create these homeroom concepts, Gary Rummer's, you know, technology domains. Again, where technology is the application of science, uh, not, you know, computers or tools or, you know, but the application of science, uh, research-based, evidence-based practices in these various things that affect performance. Um, so that was my intent, so, you know, Dick said, you know, he was he was a contributor to this thing. In fact, he and and uh, uh, Jeannie Farrington uh, wrote the new definition of HPT, which I've captured on a website. Uh, uh, HPT, I think if you were to search on that, it's a WordPress site. It's either the full word uh, human performance technology dot something. I can't remember. It may be org. And uh, but that's where. Um, I've retained all of the outputs of that entire three-year initiative because quite frankly I wasn't sure that ISPI wouldn't bury that and would never see the light of day again and I guess it's my dream that someday we'll have a professional organization that embraces all things improvement wise well beyond uh, the knowledge and skills of performers and look at all the various performance because what our clients really want is their performance context improved, their 
processes improve, their products improve, they make things better, faster, and cheaper. And quite frankly, you're not going to get there if your whole thing is just training and development, addressing knowledge and skills. Uh, that ain't going to cut it. And uh, I'm an ISD practitioner. I don't do all the rest of these things here, but I want to be appreciative of it. I want to know enough about it so that when I'm doing analysis and I'm looking for why are there these problems in the workplace, master performers have to deal with things. Maybe we can eliminate some of the barriers that they have, strategies and tactics, how to avoid in the first place and what to do if unavoidable. That's, that was what I was wanting. Um, that's kind of what I felt I got in the early days of NSPI. Um, you know, I wanted to be able to embrace educational technology and the use of technology tools for training or for process mapping or for design of experiments, etc., etc. So, the 2012 conference, eight years ago, was my last conference. Uh, I was busy with work and then I decided that, um, I don't know, I, maybe it was time for to turn the keys over to the next generation and let them uh, take the society where they will. Um, my hope was that they would broaden it out, that they would embrace a broader perspective of what uh, human performance technology could be all about. It's not just about the human, but as the late Don Tosti said, you know, all performance is a human endeavor. So I would then say, well, yeah, so we we, we designed it and created bulldozers because we were trying to help human performance rather than digging a ditch with a hand, with your hands, or a shovel, let's use a bulldozer, etc. So, you know, we humans create tools and technologies and see what really works to advance us and our efforts to live and work on the planet. Um, but anyway, so. Um, so, uh, so I found myself not being involved as much, although I've written articles for the international organization. Most of my efforts are now supporting some of the chapters. Uh, many of the chapters have disappeared and died, but I'm trying to support, you know, the ISBI BAPS, Bay Area chapter out in San Francisco. Um, there's a strong chapter in Detroit, my home chapter. Um, I think they're struggling a little bit too. The Chicago chapter has entirely disappeared. There's a website, but there's nothing on there for the past five, six years. The Charlotte chapter is still going strong. Um, there's a chapter in the Tampa uh, or Orlando area. I forget what their name is. Uh, but anyway, so I think they're still going on. There's a chapter in Boston uh, that I think is still going on. There's the Potomac chapter in the Washington, D.C. area. There's the... Uh, um, there's a chapter outside of Norfolk, um, um, the Bay, uh, what do they call their chapter? Anyway, so there's, there are several chapters that are continuing and doing good work. Uh, I guess it's my hope that uh, somehow um, that we find a new approach. If the current approach isn't working, then we need to find a new way to reach out and attend to the needs of our audience, people that are in the business of training or process improvement via Six Sigma and Lean, and help them improve their own skill set in their domain, their home room, and learn about these other areas because Six Sigma practitioners need to figure out when, when instruction will help them uh, to a great extent with their trying to improve process performance and when it's not and when it should be involved early on is the answer to that. So um, there's many things that we can learn from each other, not that we have to try to uh, become experts in all things HPT, uh, because there, I don't think there's going to be any renaissance men or women who know it all, as maybe that was possible 400 years ago, although probably more of a, a, a concept, an ideal than an actuality. But um, um, that's my story about NSPI, ISPI, no organization has wasted more of my time than ISPI, but on the other hand, no organization has given me more back, lending itself to my professional development than that organization, the International Society for Performance Improvement. Thank you. So that's the end of this, the fifth of my series, Adventures in Performance-Based Training and Development with your host, me, Guy Wallace. This series, of course, is also known as the Insomnia Solution. 
Not your, not my insomnia, but yours. Anyway, cheers.